The two most popular brands, of course, is number one, Milo, which is the chocolate drink that all West Malaysians love. And then, of course, Maggie, which is a famous instant noodle brand. Uh, of course, as I said earlier on, it's 909 million when it comes to the Q4 operating cash flow. Now, what's interesting is that it actually increased uh, by nearly 30% from 726 million in 20. Uh, 19. And so what does this translate to? Well, this translates to a growing industry. All right? It's a very stable and growing industry. Now, according to this report, uh, this industry, the F&B industry in Malaysia, is poised to grow at 7.6% every year, which is really, really good. Most businesses, especially today, thanks to COVID, is not growing at that amount. Hello guys, welcome back to the channel, best place for long-term stock investing. My name is MJ and today we're going to talk about Nestle. What are we going to talk about? The history, the management, the business model, what they do, uh, the financials. And of course, if you stay all the way until the end, uh, I'll explain to you what I think are some of the risks and potential rewards that you can get from the stock. Okay, so why am I covering Nestle uh, Malaysia? You may have heard of the name, but maybe you don't know uh, a lot about the stock. And even if you do know, uh, I think there's quite a lot of things to talk about when it comes to Nestle Malaysia. Now, it is also one of the most uh, successful stocks uh, in Malaysia. Right Since 2006, the share price has gone up 450%. And if you go all the way back to IPO, the price has gone up. Just the price alone will have gone up more than uh, 20, 25 times. If you include dividends, it's of course way, way more. Nestle Malaysia is also the highest price stock in Busa, Malaysia. And it hit a high, all-time high of 154 ringgit per share in March 2018. But since then, it has hovered around the 130 ringgit price per share range. So the question on most uh, investors' mind is, why is the share price flat for so long, for three years now? Is it because of stagnation? Or in fact, is this a good opportunity to buy in? Of course, keep watching to find out. Now, before we begin, uh, in the description or the comments, uh, there is a link for you to sign up for our Build a Six-Figure Portfolio Guidebook. It's totally free. And this is going to be really useful for you, especially if you're just starting out in your stock market investing journey. Okay, so let's start with what Nestle Malaysia does. Most of you watching this probably know it, but for those that don't, uh, let me explain. So they're basically a food and beverage company with a lot of brands. And their most, or their two most popular brand, of course, is number one, Milo, which is the chocolate drink that all of us Malaysians love. And then, of course, Maggie, which is a famous instant noodle brand. Following that, you have uh, Nescafe, and then Kit Kat, you know, that's really famous as well. Nestum Omega Plus, La Crimera, which is ice cream, Cocoa Crunch cereals, Drumstick, Honey Star, Fitness, Nestle Professional. Now it's pretty cool, right? They also do Starbucks coffee at home. So it's like a takeaway Starbucks. That's, you know, something that Nestle Malaysia does as well. Lactogro, which is probably milk. Uh, Sejora, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Serilac, and then uh, Nutrin. Now for the basic history of Nestle. So Nestle was actually formed in uh, 1905 uh, based on a merger. So it used to be two companies actually. And so the first company that uh, is part of this merger is the Anglo-Swiss Milk Company, which is founded uh, in 1866 by brothers George and Charles Page. Then the second company is uh, Farin Lacti Henry Nestle. I'm pretty sure I did not pronounce that right. Apologies, uh, anyone who is Swiss. And uh, founded in 1867 by Henry Nestle. So Nestle came into a lot of prominence uh, during World War II, actually. They were very involved in providing uh, sweetened milk, condensed milk, and infant milk formula. So that's how they, in a way, got their first big break. So if you haven't noticed by now, Nestle is actually a Swiss company, you know, from Switzerland. And in terms of Nestle Malaysia, they actually started their operations in 1912, actually starting first in Penang and later on in the 30s, the 1930s uh, in Kuala Lumpur. 
They got listed on Busa Malaysia in 1989. And today, they have 44 sales office nationwide alongside six factories. So now let's talk a little bit about Nestle's basic business model. What they do is they source, well, first of all, the agriculture, right? So things like wheat and cocoa needs to be, you know, grabbed hold of first, right? And then these are being sold to Nestle through tier one suppliers who also deliver all these uh, commodities to them. So Nestle doesn't actually do all this. They just buy the stuff and get the delivery services from these tier one suppliers. And once they get these supplies, these commodities or agricultural commodities, what they'll do is because of quality control, they'll actually manufacture and uh, produce the product uh, in their own factories. And so once that is done, they'll actually pass it on to, um, you know, places like Tesco, right? Your convenience stores, your mamak stores or restaurants and all that for you and I, people like you and I to consume. So that's the very basic business model. It's actually a very simple business model, quite frankly. Okay, so now that you know about the business, let's find out more a little bit about the person running the business. In this case, it's the Spanish CEO, Juan Aranos. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So he has a degree in economics from the University of, and I'm going to pronounce this correctly, University of Barcelona. Okay, in terms of his career, he started off in 1990 as actually an internal auditor for Nestle Spain. 1995, he was part of the strategy business controller. He was a strategy business contro uh, controller for a number of categories under Nestle Switzerland. Then in 1998, he was the controller for the ice cream and frozen food business in Nestle Italy. So you can see he has always been at Nestle from the beginning and he's hopping all around Europe, right? Then in 2003, he became the CFO of ironically not a European country, but the Caribbean division for Nestle. And then in 2007, he went back home to Spain to be the CFO of the Iberian region. Now in 2012, he was a senior vice president of group control in Nestle Switzerland. 2014, senior vice president of CFO zone Asia, Oceania and Africa. So you can see he's climbing step by step getting uh, more prominent as time passes. And finally, in 2018, he became the CEO of Nestle Malaysia. So he's literally been all over the place in a good way. Now, let's take a look at the numbers, the financials, right? So for revenue, when it comes to Nestle Malaysia, 2011, that number was 4.7 billion ringgit. And then in 2020, uh, they grew to 5.4 billion ringgit, which represents about a 1.55 uh, percent growth per annum over the past 10 years. Nothing too impressive, unfortunately. So when we break it down to the fourth quarter of 2020, they generated a revenue of 1.37 uh, billion ringgit, which is about a 3.1% increase from the previous 2019 quarter four. Uh, now, why is that the case? A lot of it is because the consumption at home grew by 60% and by home, I mean Malaysia. And then they also do have some sort of export business, which uh, also did pretty decent. Now let's look at the profit before tax. So that number in 2011 is 559 million ringgit, and that grew to 725 million ringgit, uh, which represents a 3% growth per annum. Slightly better than revenue, but basically, so breaking it down to the fourth quarter of 2020, the profit before tax is about 1674 Million, which is actually a negative 3% uh, decline compared to the previous Q4. Now, why is that the case? Well, number one, of course, business is not as good thanks to COVID. Secondly, uh, they had higher operational costs because of COVID. They needed to protect their workers a lot more. And so all of this in, uh, will involve more costs, of course. So now, how about my favorite number, which is the operating cash flow. So from 2011, that number was 561 million. Uh, 2020, that number grew the most compared to the other two, which is revenue and profit before tax, to 909 million, which is about a 5.5% increase year on year over the past 10 years. So how about the quarterlies? 
uh, when it comes to the operating cash flow. So for those of you all who don't know this, uh, the cash flow statement is tabulated and built on a cumulative basis. So for example, if I say that it's the second quarter's operating cash flow, that means they're adding the Q1 plus Q2's operating cash flow. So now in, in, in Nestle's quarter four, it means that all quarters are being added up together, which you know what, what it means is that the that is the annual number. So it's actually pretty much the same uh, as the 2020 annual report or the one that is about to appear. Now, uh, of course, as I said earlier on, it's 909 million when it comes to the Q4 operating cash flow. Now, what's interesting is that it actually increased uh, by nearly 30% from 726 million in 2019. So why is that the case? Number one is because even though business did worse, especially during a COVID year, uh, they actually, their working capital actually reduced. So what that basically means is that the collection of cash was actually a lot stronger compared to 2019. In fact, it's so strong that it actually outdid whatever decline in business that they had uh, thanks to COVID during 2020. Another reason also is because their taxes reduced. Not sure why. So the last important number is going to be a, a number that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, which is the net debt. And so they have a net debt of 350 uh, million ringgit. In fact, they only have, they actually have less than 10 million ringgit in the bank. So is this actually a uh, worrying? Again, I will explain more later on. All right, so now that you got all the important facts out of the way, uh, now it's time for some analysis, right? So what are some of the things that I think are good about the company? I think right at the top uh, is definitely the super brands that they have. And here's what I mean by super, right? If you think of chocolate drink as a Malaysian, right? Um, and if you're non-Malaysian and if you've been living here a while, uh, you know this as well. When you think of chocolate drink, you don't call it hot chocolate for Malaysians, right? Overseas people call it hot chocolate. What do we call it here? We call it Milo, right? Milo is just a type of hot chocolate. Yet, we call a hot chocolate drink Milo. Now, this might be a funny point to you, but to me, what it means is that it's so ingrained in our head now as Malaysians that when we talk about hot chocolate, immediately uh, we go to Milo. The same can be said for Maggie. Right, what do all of us Malaysians say? Hey, I want to eat Maggi Mee. Even though maybe it's a Korean brand or a Japanese brand or any other brand. But when we use in normal conversation, I want to eat Maggi Mee, people understand it. Hey, I want to eat instant noodle. Doesn't mean that I have to actually eat from the brand Maggi, but you get the point, right? These are what I mean by super brands. And brands are very good because it associates positive emotions in our head every time we talk about it. And so, when we have a positive emotion about Nescafe, about uh, uh, Maggie, about Kit Kat, about Milo, we are also having a positive association with Nestle. And all of this means that a lot of the profits, the future profits of Nestle uh, is pretty secured. Okay, here's the second thing that I think is you know pretty great for the industry is, well, it's the industry itself, right? Malaysians, we love food. Right, food and beverages. We cannot live. Some people cannot even live without Milo. Some people need to eat, you know, Kit Kat every week. Some people need to drink two nice cafes a day. And so, what does this translate to? Well, this translates to a growing industry. All right, it's a very stable and growing industry. Now, according to this report, uh, this industry, the F&B industry in Malaysia, is poised to grow at seven point six percent every year, which is really, really good. Most businesses, especially today, thanks to COVID, is not growing at that amount. Now, I happen to think it's probably a little bit lower than that, but that's really just my opinion. The basic idea is that food and beverages is now going to die. We literally need to eat it. And, you know, some of the products that Nestle does taste good. And a lot of it is our childhood. A lot of it is very ubiquitous. We do it every day, you know. So it's all, it's a part of our lives is what I'm trying to say. Now, this next one is a pretty important one, which is about capital efficiency. So, you know, earlier on, I talked about the net debt situation in Nestle Malaysia, right? And the fact that they are net in a net debt position and that they have actually very, very little cash at about 9 million. Now, on the surface, and for a lot of newbie investors, they look at that and you say, hey, that's not good, right? I want to buy a company that has very little loans. Or at least if they have loans, they must have a lot more cash. 
Now that's true for a lot of businesses, but I think the case of Malaysia is a little bit different, right? Uh, Nestle is a very big company. It's a very well-known company. And it's also a very well-run company. So what this means is that they are able to manage their cash flow very well. So yes, while it's true that that is risk, and I totally agree with that, but consider this as well. Every year, Nestle will generate seven, eight, nine hundred million worth of operating cash flow versus 350 million in debt. So what this means, think of it this way, right? Imagine you had a housing loan of 350,000. Now that sounds like a lot, but your annual income is 900,000 ringgit. So is that loan really a big problem? I think not. And in fact, you having earning 900,000 is not as good as Nestle making 900,000 in operating cash flow. Why? Because you might lose your job, but people will still drink Milo, they will still drink Nescafe, they will still eat Maggie Me. So in that case, uh, you know, the, the cash flows for Nestle is so strong that they actually don't need to have so much cash in the business in the first place. And that is exactly why this net debt situation, which usually is a risk, is actually a very good point for Nestle. Okay, sticking with financials is the dividends. I think this is probably the most exciting and interesting part about uh, if you were a Nestle shareholder. So over the past 10 years, uh, well, first of all, they paid dividends uh, since probably the beginning, right? Certainly in the past 10 years, they've always paid dividends. Number two, the dividends have actually grown 5.7% every year. Now, why do I say this is a, actually a really good thing? A uh, really good thing for Nestle. Think of it this way, right? How many of you right now uh, you have a job in maybe a corporation or an MNC or even a, a, at an SME or any company for that matter. How many of you, your salary is actually growing at 5.7% every year? I would guess not a lot, right? So the way you think about Nestle is that the dividends that they give, which is a form of income every year, uh, is actually growing faster than your salary, very likely. So this is why I think uh, dividends has been a huge plus point and will likely continue to be a huge plus point for uh, Nestle going forward. Uh, next, which is the management. So um, I like companies where they promote internally, especially if the uh, incoming CEO has been there for a long time, was uh, there since uh, his youth, so he understands the culture of the company. So this is great, right? Because uh, the uh, Spanish CEO, Juan Arnos, has been at Nestle f since the beginning of his career, pretty much. So that's something that, uh, you know, quite positive for me. Next, uh, well, Nestle is a recession-proof business, right? People got to eat even when times are bad. In fact, more people will buy more Milo and Maggie Mee or instant noodles when times are bad. Uh, and as proof, uh, during from 2019 to 2020, revenue only dropped 2%, right? In a year where so many businesses were failing left, right, and center, uh, Nestle was barely affected. The last good thing that I like about Nestle is that it is actually a cash placeholder. So what do I mean by that? So when it comes to managing your own portfolio, when it comes to stock investing, um, you buy a stock, it goes up a lot, and you sell it, right? So what happened? You sell it, you convert it into cash. Now, we all know that cash is trash, right? Nobody likes cash. Uh, because, you know, it, 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 there's inflation and all that. So sometimes, uh, you know, I'll be worried or I'll, I'll keep wondering and searching, oh, where do I put this cash? Where do I put it in the next investment? And sometimes it's not easy to find good investments, right? So what can you do? Well, if you don't know where to put, but you want something better than cash, that's where you can consider Nestle, right? They pay a good dividend, whereas cash uh, doesn't pay you uh, much interest uh, when it comes to your brokerage account. So that's another pro tip for you guys. All right, so that's uh, a lot of good points about Nestle. And well, it is a good company in my view. But here's the thing, there are risks, right? And so I want to share with you some of the risks that uh, I think you really need to know. The first one is that the revenue is uh, actually slowing down. Uh, so if you look at the, if you can calculate yourself, the revenue growth, the 15-year revenue growth is about 3.84%. Uh, the 10-year growth is 3.17% and the five-year growth is about 2.61%. So you can see a decline. So that's just the revenue. How about the profit, right? Profit growth, 15 years is 5.81%. 
10 year is 4.77% and the 5 year is 1.1%. When it comes to operating cash flow, uh, the decline is even steeper, right? 7.42% for the 15 year, 4.38% for the 10 year and 0.8% uh, for the 5 years. Now with the recent 909 million operating cash flow, uh, it should be a little bit higher. My estimation is probably closer to 3%. But you get the point, right? It's actually slowing down. So why is it actually slowing down? There are a lot of reasons why. Uh, the first is probably there's always competition. But that's a, a weak reason in my point of view. I think a stronger reason is the fact that the Malaysian market is not growing as fast anymore. Right? Uh, by my estimations, if you, you can do your own calculations on this, but if the average Malaysian spends... 5% of his income on Nestle products. This means that you will have a 17 billion ringgit market in Malaysia. Nestle's revenue is already 5 billion. So it's pretty close to what we call saturation. Uh, there's obviously still room to grow. It will take time for it to grow. But that is on the assumption that Malaysians spend 5% of uh, their income on average. And my suspicion is that it's actually uh, quite a bit lower which is actually the second uh, risk that I see, right? The Malaysian market is too small and they have not made a lot of progress overseas. Now, the next risk I see, ironically, are the dividends, right? The fact that they can pay out so much dividends. One way to look at, in, uh, at dividends as an investor is that it, the company has declared that it does not have any more reinvestment opportunities. In other words, uh, they have no idea how to spend that money to grow the business, which means the growth has slowed or is close to non-existent. That is the case with Nestle in Malaysia right now. So don't be too happy that they pay a lot of dividends. It just means that, uh, you know, Milo is not growing as fast anymore. Now, this next risk is going to be important for you guys to know and uh, it's not talked about uh, very often when it comes to uh, management and investing and that has to do with the CEO now the CEO as I said earlier on has been around for a long time so he knows the culture and all that so he has built his way up and that's a good point but one thing that I want to uh, bring to light is the fact that he has always been in the finance area or finance departments um, everywhere he has went to so why is this a, a potential issue it's not 100% it's not for sure that it's bad but why is this a potential issue for you as an investor. The reason is because usually I like the incoming CEO to either be in the marketing division, the chief marketing officer, or the operations division or the chief operating officer. Why is this the case? When it comes to the operations and the marketing manager, they usually speak to the customers a little bit more. So they're a little bit more on the ground and they actually talk to the people that they're selling the product to. All this is important from a business perspective because you always want your CEO to truly understand the mind of the consumer, the mind of the Milo drinker, the mind of the Kit Kat eater. Now, as someone who is in the finance departments all the time, you're not talking to consumers or your customers, right? You're probably behind a computer looking at spreadsheets or going to meetings internally to talk about the financial health of the company, to count the money, to make sure that cash flow is good, etc., etc. So this can mean that Mr. Juan, and again, this is not 100% necessarily true, but th there is a risk that uh, he does not have uh, the same kind of touch with the Nestle consumers than a operations or marketing manager would. So this is one risk, a uh, very, very pro tip for you when it comes to analyzing a company. Hopefully now you've um, known more about Nestle. Hopefully now that you know a lot more about investing and if you're already an investor or you think you're investing, I hope that you now are better equipped to decide whether or not you should invest or keep your shares. Um, of course, if you like this sort of videos, come watch some of our other videos. Follow us on our other social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, whatnot. Uh, you know, links are all in the description. And of course, we have a, a brand new podcast. Go check it out if you like long-form content. See you in the next video.